is uh, uh timothy his name's timothy he's he's from england yeah yeah and you guys you guys were both like like he started off making some showing some hope or whatever and then he fell off the the rails with his whole idea that god's done with israel forever and and uh that he that the ad 70 was the final divorce and god's eternally done with israel and that the bible's all a bunch of lies and god's not going to keep his promises to israel and no no that's that's not what it is wade that's, that's it's exactly not about not keeping promises it has nothing to do with that that's, i mean you know if you the apostle paul made it clear in romans 9 through 11 talking about israel's past their present state and their future and they are present tense blind in part until the fullness of the gentiles comes in and then he says and all israel will be saved um and that presently they are enemies of the gospel for our sake but is touching the election they are blood of the father so that's what paul's at describing their status in this age that we live in right now and the idea that I mean, you look at the new covenant alone, like, do you, I, I don't know if you even know what your position is on the new covenant, but do you think that you're part of the new covenant right now? Absolutely. See, I mean, that's just, that's just denying the words on the page that in both the old Testament and the new Testament in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 and Hebrews 8, 8 through 11, covenant was with Israel and it was never intended to save and it was administration of death and all that but it was a schoolmaster to bring him to Christ but he makes it clear in Jeremiah and Hebrews he says I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah and you and I are neither because the body of Christ was a mystery revealed to the Apostle Paul so you know you just have to unless you just go like the covenant theologians and the catholics and all these replacement theology teachings out there that essentially we replaced israel god's done with them forever which that opens up a whole can of worms of all kinds of issues but you know i don't know if you think are do you think you're also israel galatians six sixteen. The Israel of God. That's not you. That's what it says about the Galatians. I mean, it says about the no, Israel no. of God. No. It's a spiritual it says, covenant. No, it says, and the Israel of God. And, and, and I'm mentioning. So, so you, you mentioned Romans 9 to 11. Do you know, do you know where Paul is getting his thinking for Romans 9 through 11 in the Old Testament? from the Holy Spirit of God. <clears throat> it's coming from Isaiah 27. He's using scripture from Isaiah chapter 27. No, I'm, I'm, I, I know the Old Testament references, but it wasn't like Paul was just running rogue and coming up with his own stuff. Let me ask you this, and I, somebody asked you that question, I don't remember if it was Timothy or somebody, that asked you, essentially if you believe that the bible is the word of god and you kind of got this like like while he was finished watching you started laughing and i don't think you ever really answered that like do you believe that every single word in this book is true and that it's god's word yes yes i do in the sense that it's it's a complete cohesive story talking about the the schoolmaster of the law all the way to the christ so I, I, not, not that it's got a, a, a general, hey, they kind of get the gist of the story right. Do you believe that every single word in that book is inspired by God? Yes, I do. The King James Version? No, I don't. Well, we're not going to go down that road right now. Um, but basically... you, have, you have bigger issues, you know, beyond your preterism, the fact that in fact, why don't you just share for the audience um, 
why you believe that the, and I don't call it, I don't say Yahweh, by the way, it's Jehovah, if anything, but the yod hey or whatever, um, that was a more modern vowel adding, make it Yahweh and all that stuff. But anyway, Jehovah, Lord, um, <clears throat> all, all caps, Lord, why on earth and how did you arrive to the point where you think that the that the God of the Old Testament is Satan? Well, before we get on that, I'd like to talk about the fulfilled eschatology and, and why. Well, that's not what I brought you up here for. It, it, you just don't want to hear it. The thing is, is, is you I was trying to. No, no, no. It, it's important. No. No, we don't have the same God. So let's start there. Okay. All right. Fine. We'll start here. Okay. Okay. So in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 and 9, it says, The Most High, El Elyon, gave an inheritance to all the angels of God, and Yahweh's inheritance was Jacob. So to be the Most High, would you receive an inheritance? Does the Most High receive an inheritance, or would that not, be one of his sons? No, I didn't bring you up here to start going through and asking questions about certain passages. How on earth did you arrive? Was it just simply reading the writings of Gnostics? No, not at all. No. So what what brought you to the conclusion that Yahweh is Satan? That's well, what I want to know. Well, El Elyon is the Most High. Who divided the nations that is the most high god in the um in in basically the scripture now what's funny and what's interesting about all this is when jesus is talking about the sermon on the mount or different areas he says you have heard it said eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth but i say unto you he says and he's taking that from exodus chapter 21 so he's clearly saying something against moses but but there's a lot more so needless to say, uh, Yahweh says that uh, if, if you do what I tell you to do, you're going to be blessed and, and, uh, and the rain's going to come on you. All right. But if you don't do what I tell you to do, you're going to be cursed and the rain's not going to be for you. Well, Matthew 545, Jesus says the rain falls upon the just as well as the unjust. Joshua, you're not answering my question. This is not like a platform to come on and start teaching Gnosticism. I'm, I'm asking you how you got how you arrived to the position of Gnosticism. I arrived because of Jesus breaking us free from the law. Jesus breaking us free from the law, how he was a ransom on the cross. Okay, so first of all, we as Gentiles were never under the law, so he didn't break you free of any law. Well, he, he broke the Jews free of the law. He came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So because, because Jesus came and, and like Paul said, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness and all the other passages and, and nailing it to the cross and stuff. So because of that, you just decided, okay, God in the Old Testament, Satan. No, that's not, that's not what I just decided. The, uh, Paul even talks about Satan is the God of this world who has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and line that up with chapter 4, he's talking about the God of Judaism, the, the, the one who has blinded their minds, the angels that have actually blinded their eyes from the truth. You see, Satan even offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. In the Old Testament, Yahweh is the one who holds the keys to the kingdom of the world. That's why when Jesus is resurrected, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So... What we're seeing here, we're, we're seeing something. You see, I, I, I see what you're doing here, Wade, as it is. And I'm trying, basically, I, I'd rather start at the idea of preterism and why it's so important that Jesus returned already. All right? We don't have the same God. Uh, Wade, Wade, let, let me ask you. You believe in the new heavens and new earth? Of course I do. Okay. Is is there death and sin in the new heavens and new earth? 
No, and I saw the I saw you part of your discussion about that from Isaiah sixty five earlier today. That's dealing with the kingdom. But again, like I said, you you're, you're, you keep wanting to steer it back to promote your full preterist. This is this, this is what I want to talk about. This is why I want to talk about this to you, because it's so important to understand the kingdom's already here. No, the kingdom is not here, and Jesus is not ruling and reigning on this earth right now, and Satan is not bound in the bottomless pit. Well, Romans 16, 20, Paul even tells the Romans that Satan was getting ready to be crushed under their feet shortly. Under their feet. Your feet. Not ours, 2,000 years out in the future. Satan was the synagogue of Satan. Revelation 2, 9 and 3. That's nine. all future. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Or heaven is your throne and the earth is your footstool. Or mine. But the, the, the dominion of the earth was lost when Adam sinned. Yes. And then when Satan fell prior to that, by the way, but that Satan and, and evil and principalities and wickedness and rulers and, and darkness and all that stuff, Satan still has access to heaven, okay? Heaven is his throne, the earth is his footstool. When Christ gives Michael the archangel the nod to take Satan and a third of the angels and cast them out for good out of the heavens, he will, Christ will establish full dominion over the heavens and then return shortly after to the earth for his second coming, which he will then take full dominion of the earth as his footstool. I mean, that's all still future. So the, the, the idea that we, that the world that we live in right now, you know, you try going over to Israel or your local synagogue and walk in and try to tell a Jew that they are on Christ of what their understanding is and try to convince them that we're living in that kingdom that was promised to them or whatever, they would, they would, they'd either just die laughing or something, <clears throat> something that would be quite the opposite of a reaction that you would expect. Like they would just look at you like a calf looking at a new gate or whatever to think that this is the kingdom and that New Jerusalem, you think New Jerusalem's here right now? New Jerusalem is the bride. It's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Right, and that's future. That's the church suspended between heaven and earth. It never lands on earth. It's suspended between heaven and earth. So, so the body of Christ that has nothing to do with Israel's land laws and covenants and everything is, is now a city that has the 12 gates named after the 12 tribes of Israel with 12 foundation of the 12 apostles to Israel. What does that have to do with the body of Christ? There are no Jews or Gentiles in the body of Christ. We are members of his body and the fullness of him with Christ as the head. Right. Absolutely. Now, the new heavens and new earth, there is sin and death in the new heavens and the new earth, according to Isaiah 65, verse 20. So if the new heavens and the new earth is a place where there is sin and death, if it, it, it's not so. So what it is, is it's because we've been deceived for so long. The media, no, the mass media. Deceived. No, I'm telling you right now, even 1948 Israel, that's not even a promise or a covenant based on the Bible. They had to obey I, the covenant in order no, to go I back to the land. That. So we're, we're living in the time that, that is that was a mystery that is prophesied. You're not going to find any biblical prophecy happening right now during this period. None. So the 1948 thing, that little strip of land on the Mediterranean only makes up about 3% of the land promised to Israel. It stretches all the way from Euphrates to the Nile. Okay. All right. So that That's not, I don't believe that 1948 was a fulfillment of any prophecy or anything else, you know, like that. But so you think new Jerusalem is floating above us right now somewhere and that that's the body of Christ? No, no, it is the body of Christ. It's us. We are the new Jerusalem. 
We are suspended between heaven and earth. Bring heaven to earth. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 was even seated in heavenly places with Christ. So you it's don't a even believe the Bible about New Jerusalem. You just completely went origin on it and spiritualized it to make it not actually a city with gates and a street of gold and the tree of life and the river and the foundations. And you just throw all that out and say, nope, that's us. Je Jesus said the kingdom doesn't come with careful observation. He said the kingdom is within you. Why, why are we making it no, something physical? That's not what he was saying. When he said the kingdom's within you, it's because he was standing among them and he is the king. He was not I, saying that the kingdom is within them. Do you, do you have Christ dwelling within you? Yeah, but I don't have the kingdom dwelling in me. <laughs> if, if Christ is a king, the kingdom is within you. If, if he's the king, there's a kingdom that he dwells over, and it's your temple, which is your body. Yeah, I'm a temple. And temple there's a the spirit. King. And I have the spirit of Christ. There, there's, there's two kingdoms in scripture. In Matthew, it's called in the gospel called the kingdom of God during that during Christ's earthly ministry dealing with the physical earthly kingdom that was promised to Israel that God will fulfill the kingdom of God that Paul preached he defined in Romans 14 17 that it's not a kingdom of meat or drink that it's a spiritual kingdom of righteousness and the Holy Ghost and all that it's a spiritual overarching kingdom but the physical earthly kingdom is not the same. That's, that is the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus and the 12 and John the Baptist preach to Israel. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. It was, they were being offered the kingdom. And then Christ gave them the one year of probation after they rejected the Messiah for the three years because the, the core of the gospel of the kingdom when, it's, when they said, repent for the kingdom of heaven, and that repent meant Israel needs to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Not that he was going to die on the cross, be buried and raised again, you know, which is the gospel that re was revealed to Paul after Acts 9. But it was for Israel. I'm not sent but to the lodge sheep of the house of Israel. When he sent out the disciples, he said, go not in the way of the Gentiles. That was about offering the kingdom to Israel, but because the religious leaders rejected Christ specifically, he told him in Matthew 23, 13, that you're not only preventing yourselves from going in the kingdom, but you're preventing everybody else. And he gave them one year after his ascension to repent. It was the deals with the, the parable of the husbandman and vineyardman where he came three years in a row and there, the, the fig tree didn't produce fruit. And he said, cut it down. He said, give it one more year, and if it doesn't produce fruit, then cut it down. So they were given one more year to and One year after the ascension of Christ, they, they had already rejected Christ. They stumbled at the stumbling stone. By rejecting Christ, they rejected the Father. And then they stoned Holy Ghost-filled Stephen in Acts 7. Strike one, strike two, strike three. And Israel fell and began their diminishing and have been blind in part for almost 2,000 years now. But that this whole period of time we live in right now was is not in prophecy anywhere. But when the body of Christ, the day of redemption happens, when we're caught up out of here, that clock starts ticking for Daniel's 70th week that you think took place in the first century seven final years where very specific events are going to happen that have never happened. And then at the conclusion of that, those that endure the same will be saved. The, the abomination of desolation and all the thing, the events and everything that happened and the judgments leading to the second coming of Christ, when he will blot out Israel's sins and forgive them. And they will, he will fulfill the new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah and forgive their sins. No man will have to know their neighbor, tell their neighbor or know the Lord because they'll all know him. And he will put his, give them a new heart, new spirit, put his law in their hearts and cause them to keep his judgments and statutes because they're going in to become a kingdom of priests where they will finally be a blessing to the world. 
during the millennial kingdom. None of that stuff has happened. Is it, the, the Gentile world is not being blessed through Israel right now, and Christ certainly isn't ruling and reigning from the throne of David in Jerusalem. Okay. All right. So you believe the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two separate entities. The kingdom of God is spiritual and the kingdom of heaven is a physical thing? There's there's a little bit of overlap when you look at the parallel passages in, outside of Mark in the four Gospels. Yes, there they, is. They, they refer to the kingdom of God. But the, that whole period of time was dealing with Israel and their kingdom. But when Paul talks about the kingdom of God, because see, he's, Paul says that in Romans 14, 17, that the kingdom of God's not of meat and drink. Jesus said in Luke 22, you know, at the Last Supper and all that stuff, he says, I'm not going to eat anything or drink anything until I go into that kingdom with you where where the 12 apostles will sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. That's never happened. And he says, I'll eat and drink in that kingdom. So that kingdom is of meat and drink. But the kingdom of God that Paul is talking about is a spiritual kingdom that's not of meat or drink. There's two different kingdoms there. And then after the millennial kingdom is done, and yes, it's a thousand years. That's why it said six times in six verses, thousand years, thousand years. At the end of that, Satan will be loosed for a season. The final Gog and Magog will be done and over quickly. And then at that point, you have the resurrection of the unjust and they will stand before the great white throne judgment. And after that, There'll be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. And I do agree that that new Jerusalem is is the bride of Christ. That holy city coming down as a bride adorned for her husband, and John was taken up, looked at the mountain, which is Mount Zion or whatever, and and saw the holy city, the Lamb's bride. But that's that's the eternal state, not the millennial kingdom and if you get it confused and you start trying to take prophecies during king era, here, here's the thing the the very beginning Galatians or Genesis 1 1 in the beginning God created the heaven and earth it concludes with a new heaven new earth and a new Jerusalem his purpose through the earth deals with Israel prophecy their kingdom is earthly their their paradise is earthly in the heart of the earth the body of christ was a mystery kept secret and revealed to the apostle paul along with the mystery of the rapture the mystery of the blindness in part with israel the gospel that we believe today to be saved that he calls my gospel and makes it clear in galatians 1 11, 12 that he received the gospel not of men neither was he taught by revelation of jesus christ jesus came back and gave all this information to the Apostle Paul and it's mystery, body of Christ, and heavenly. When we get saved and become a member of the body of Christ, we're seated in heavenly places, our conversations in heaven, and when we die, we go to heaven and have a purpose in the heavens as members of his body, the fullness of him. And then when it's all said and done, after the millennial kingdom, um, Paul said in Ephesians 1, um, he said, uh, making known unto us the mystery of his will, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, the times when all times end, the times of the Gentiles, the times of Israel, the times of restitution, the times of refreshing, all time when it ends he will gather together in one all things in christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him so his purpose in the heavens is through the body of christ and was a mystery his purpose through the earth israel and deals with prophecy but when it's all said and done there's a marriage between heaven and earth and new jerusalem comes down and all things are going to be gathered together in one in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. That's the eternal purpose that God has in Christ. And what we, as members of the body of Christ, our involvement and role in that 
is was a mystery and is heavenly and Israel the old covenant was with, with Israel and the new covenant is with Israel then there's a third thing called the body of Christ the one new man that God's making of twain from Jew and Gentile to be the fullness of Christ with him as the head so I mean <clears throat> If you if you fall into the trap of you know thinking that that we're Israel or that God's done with Israel, whether it's whether you call it supersessionism or replacement theology or anything like that, you're calling God a liar. Kind of like your video that you made where you said that that if you don't think Jesus came back in 70 AD, then you're calling Jesus a liar. Which I, I'll deal with that later. But, um, but God throughout his prophets gave very specific details surrounding that kingdom that was promised to Israel that he will keep. And um, to think that we're living in the kingdom right now with this world being the mess that it is, then you also have to think that Satan is bound. Well, in your case, God is bound. The Old Testament God is in the bottomless pit. Um, and that's obviously not the case. I agree, the God of this world, Satan, who's blinded the minds of them that believe not. Um, and I hate to say it, but he has blinded you beyond just simply blinding you of the gospel. Say, well, well, even the thousand year reign would be over, right? Which means wouldn't believe, he be in the lake of fire at this point? <laughs> he doesn't believe when, that when, when John wrote down a thousand years, six times in six verses, he doesn't believe that he meant that. Just that you know, 70 AD, God, you know, allowed the, the, the sacking of Jerusalem by Titus and his boys or whatever, and that that fulfilled everything and that Jesus physically returned to the earth and that the mountain, Mount of Olives split and the waters ran through and the mountains melted and that, that the, all of the, the, bowl judgments and trumpet judgments and um, seals, all, all that stuff, you know, was not literal in any way. That just was fulfilled in other manners back in the first century. And, and now right. we're just kind of in the limbo at this point. Can I, can I explain myself now about the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven? So kingdom of heaven is used 66 times throughout the entire Bible. In the New Testament, kingdom of God. No, no, no. K kingdom of God is used 66 times. Kingdom of heaven is used 32 times, only in the Gospel of Matthew. Reason I believe that is, is because it was a deference. It would have been an insult to say the kingdom of God to a Jew. So they used the word kingdom of heaven instead. And you can see this in the, um, uh, what parable is it? <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's about the wealthy man entering into the kingdom of heaven and the wealthy man entering into the kingdom of God. It's like Luke chapter 19 and Matthew 18. They're used interchangeably, okay? So that's the first thing I'd like to say. Secondly, Romans 9 through 11, when you look at Israel past, present, and future, in Romans 11, 25 to 27, Paul is talking about how these wild olive branches are going to be uh, sown into to the branch. They're going to be grafted into the branch, and, and, and the natural branches are going to be broken off. Okay? But where's Paul getting his thinking from? He's getting it from Isaiah chapter 27, if, if you go read it. Isaiah 27, it's talking about the day and the destruction of Leviathan. And it's talking about when Leviathan would be destroyed. And according to Isaiah chapter 27, 9 to 12, if you want to read it, we can. But basically, it says that 
Leviathan would be destroyed at the throwing down of the altar of the chalk stones. And it's talking about the destruction of the temple. And when Jesus even looks at his own disciples, they, he says, you, you see this temple? Not one stone is going to be left here. So what does any of that have to do with Romans 11 and the grafting in? Uh, because it talks about the wild olive branches in Isaiah 27, even. Yeah, but again, that's that's not the body of Christ. Paul is not. Paul doesn't even mention the body of Christ in Romans nine to eleven. He's talking about Gentiles, not believing Gentiles, not the body of Christ, where there is a Jew or Gentile. It's just talking about the nations, Gentiles, and it's talking about the unbelief of some of the natural branches being broken off for unbelief and then the wild branches being grafted in from the wild olive tree that wasn't producing fruit or whatever of being getting salvation through israel which was always the case gentiles always if they wanted salvation they were always on the outside looking in and they had to be get salvation by going if they wanted any kind of relationship with god they had to go through israel and become a proselyte and get circumcised and put themselves under the law and all that stuff and that continued on even after the death burial and resurrection with guys like cornelius and all that that's not talking about us as members of the body of christ in romans 11 being grafted in because he turns right around after that and says and if you don't watch it they were broken off for unbelief and if you don't watch it you'll be broken off and cast into the fire that's we are secure in Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit in the day of redemption. We cannot, we're not, we're not branches that can be broken off and cast into the fire of God's judgment. And so, so this is this is about Israel. Romans eleven verse twenty six and twenty seven. If you read it, these are verses that are coming from Isaiah fifty nine verse twenty and twenty one, and Isaiah twenty seven verse nine. Right, it's talking about the salvation of Israel. Yes, but in that, it's talking about the destruction of Leviathan. It says this is when the salvation of Israel is going to take place, at the destruction of Leviathan. Yeah, and who's Leviathan? Leviathan is the devil. Exactly, and who's going to be destroyed at the second coming of Christ and cast <laughs> into the bottomless pit before, before that that Israel be saved. Do you know how Leviathan is destroyed? You, you know how Isaiah 27 says Leviathan is destroyed? You, you, you know what it says? It says that wow. it's, it, it's when the throwing down of the altar of the chalk stones are taken out. It's when the destruction of the temple occurs. It's when the destruction of the temple occurs. And then after that, the bows thereof are withered, and they shall be broken off. The woman come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, he that made them will have not have mercy on them. That's what, if you read in like the book of Hebrews and, and other passages and um, uh, Matthew 24, I'm trying to think of the second Thessalonians too, but Israel, after the body of Christ is caught up out of here in Daniel's 70th week, they're going to go back to try to go back and go back to animal sacrifices. That's why they have to rebuild the third temple is to be able to go back and blaspheme the Lord by going back to the animal sacrifices and everything which is the willful sin Hebrews 10, 26 is talking about. He's like basically going through and explaining that about the blood of goats and bulls. And, and then he talks about them trotting underfoot the son of God. And, uh, uh, all right, Mike, um, that's the willful sin is Israel rejecting Christ and going back to animal sacrifices and all the rest of that stuff. So yeah, that once the temples can be destroyed, there's and and by the time you get to the you know the kingdom and certain with new temple in New Jerusalem, it's you know God and the Lamb Absolutely. in there, the I, brightness of them. I agree. So so one one thing I have to ask you.
Doesn't this sound like the things that happened back then in 70 AD? The destruction of the temple, the throwing down of the sacrifices, all these things? Doesn't that what it sounds like? The only comparison is the destruction of the temple, and that's it. And that's where people get thrown off. Even when Jesus said, you know, about that not one stone will be left and he was, you know, and he was talking about, you know, destroy this temple and in three days, I'll, he was talking about himself and his death right. and resurrection. His body. Yep. Right. But the, when he's talking about the, if you, like Hebrews 1 is like perfect example where when you take out this dispensation of grace that began with Paul and ends with the rapture, you just completely take it out of the Bible and out of the biblical timeline. And you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, where they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom only to Israel early in the book of Acts, including Pentecost and in the temple in John, you know, Acts three and four with, with Peter and John and everything still preaching the gospel of the kingdom to Israel and everything. And then the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, the Jews are scattered in Rome, Romans or in Acts 8, 1 for fear of persecution and everything. And then you just take the rest of the book of Acts and all of Paul's epistles out. And then you go right to Hebrews 1, 1 and begin the Hebrew epistles. It doesn't skip a beat. It is perfectly in line. And that's why Hebrews 1, rather than Romans 1, which is is due to the events of Acts 9 and on or whatever, that Paul becomes a, the apostle to the Gentiles and receives the mysteries and all that. Instead of it jumping from the end of Acts to all of a sudden now there's an apostle to the Gentiles in Rome, Paul an apostle um, to you know, Jesus Christ, all of the Rome and all that, instead of that all even happening, if the dispensation of grace had never happened and that the blindness in part hadn't happened, you take all that out, it's perfectly in sync. And Hebrews 1 starts off with God who at sundry times and in diverse mirrors hath spoken to us um, by your fathers, the prophets or something, and has spoken to us in these last days by his dear son. Yeah, yeah the last days. That's Israel was entering into their last days, finishing the 69th week, getting ready to go into the 70th week, which is the last days, and then the kingdom coming in or whatever. And so that's why, timeline why, you've got to take out everything regarding the dispensation of grace and the body of Christ. And it goes perfectly in sync. Hebrews, written Hebrews, dealing with them in their last days and marching orders through Daniel's 70th week. And the same with James. James is a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount to Israel, starts off to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Peter's epistle starts off in 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1, to the strangers scattered in Gentile lands like Bithynia and Cappadocia and Asia and everything. Still writing to that remnant of Israel. And then John's epistles, same thing. I write to you in First John two eighteen. This is the last time, and the Antichrist has come, and and then he says it again. This is the last time at the end of the verse, and everything, talking about the fulfilling of the new covenant. Like when he says things like, you know, that if the, if you have the Spirit of God, you don't commit sin or sinneth not or whatever. And people try to say, oh, that's talking about us. But he didn't mean they won't commit sin. He just meant you won't practice sin or whatever. No, he said they won't sin. That's because as part of the new covenant, Ezekiel 36, 26 talks about that he'll put his spirit in them and their law in them and cause them to keep his commandments and judgments and statutes or whatever. And then Jude and Revelation, and you won't find the body of Christ or the rapture anywhere in Revelation either. It was a mystery, and it's like everything goes perfectly in sync to where that's why Peter is basically quoting from Moses in First Peter two nine, 
when he says that you're a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a peculiar treasure, a holy nation, that comes right out of Exodus 19, 5 and 6, where God told Moses to tell Israel that, you know, that you're to become a kingdom of priests mm -hmm. and holy nation, a peculiar people. Right. It's the same language or whatever. Israel understood that. And that's why Peter was writing to the Jews about them going in to become a kingdom of priests. Like we as members of the body of Christ, we're not a royal priesthood. We're not a holy nation. You know, that's dealing with new covenant Israel going into that kingdom. If okay. you don't roughly divide these things, it just, it throws everything out of whack. And a lot of it's not just simply because people don't rightly divide, it's narcissists. Everybody thinks that every single passage of scripture is written directly to them. It's in their mailbox. You know, Jeremiah 29 says, you know, I know the plans I have for you and the plans to prosper you. And they think, well, that's in my bio or something. No, yeah, he yeah. wasn't talking to you. He's talking to Jerusalem or talking to Israel in captivity, in Babylon, going back and all, you know, but you you apply that principle all the way across and it's just, everything's about me, 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 I, I, or whatever. No. We as Gentiles are lucky. We slip, not lucky, but that we're blessed that we were able to slip in and have an apostle called to bring in the dispensation of grace to us and have a gospel where we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone, believing he died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and to be able to be baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit and sealed into the day of redemption and become all those things as far as the, the heavenly purpose that God has with us and stuff is much is a much higher calling essentially than being part of Israel's land law covenants and kingdom on earth. Do you believe that they received the fullness of the kingdom yet? No, the kingdom doesn't come until Christ returns and establishes his throne in Jerusalem and destroys their enemies. Because Joshua 21, 43 says that the land covenant was fulfilled. The promise was fulfilled. They received everything. Joshua 21, 43, if you go to read it. No, that's all the, the new covenant is Jeremiah, which was who is much later than Joshua, said that the new covenant, uh, behold, I make a new covenant future tense with the house of Israel and the house of Judah and gives the details of that covenant. There's no way that he, that, that the new covenant was fulfilled or that, you know, Abrahamic covenant or any of them. These are all everlasting. Well, you know, well, except for the old test, old, well, the, the new old. covenant is the old covenant and your understanding that it's just basically written on their hearts. It's the law written on their hearts. It's a better Testament, a better covenant with better promises. The the Abrahamic covenant and is eternal. The certain is was a covenant of promise. The covenant of circumcision that was made with Abraham predated the law by four hundred thirty years. Then the old covenant was made with Moses as the mediator, and Israel was given the law that was never intended to bring them to the promised land, so to speak, to bring them into that kingdom, which is why it required a better covenant for them and a better testament. And that's why Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes it. Romans 10, 4. Yeah, I agree. Right. And that's so, Romans 9 through 11 is about Israel. All three chapters start off, Paul talking about Israel. Yes, absolutely. Now, okay, so, so I'd say where our dilemma is, you believe that, Jacob's trouble is in the future. I believe it happened in 66 to 70 AD, fulfilling every single covenant or uh, prophecy that was to be fulfilled. Because what, 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 what huh? this, I know that's what you believe, just like every other preterist thinks it is. Well, it, it's, use, it's, use it, Gematria for the Antichrist, and I'm assuming you think Nero was the Antichrist. And well, well, there also is a man named John of Gashala, and he was a zealot leader, and he set himself up in the temple. So, um, and, and there is a lot of stuff that ended up occurring. Even Josephus says that when the temple was destroyed, it said the gods are departing from this place. But, all right, that's it, Luke 21. Let me ask you, Luke 21, do you believe that's future? 
drift off there. I need to use the restroom and get some more water. Okay. Good sure thing, man. I appreciate you having me on. Yes, he did. He had something called the libel. Also, there's uh, there's another mark. There's another mark that was given in Jerusalem. And um, I'm not going to talk about it yet. But No, no, I'm not in the under the impression we're in the little season. The Gog and Magog war has to occur in the last days. No, no, I'm not suggesting we're in the millennial reign. If you read Revelation 20, verse 7, it doesn't say that Christ reigns for a thousand years. It says the saints of Christ reign for a thousand years. Because Christ's kingdom is eternal. It's forever. But, okay. So, you believe Luke chapter 21 is a future prophecy? Yes. <clears throat> So in Luke 21, where it says the Romans are going to surround Jerusalem and overtake the city, you believe that's a future prophecy when that was fulfilled in 66 to 70 AD? Which, uh, hold on a second, let me pull it up. What verse are you at? It's uh, Luke 21, verse... Let's see, chapter 21. <clears throat> Let's go to verse. Um, verse 18. Well, actually, verse 20. Luke 21 20. And when you shall see <clears throat> Jerusalem compassed with armies then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled, all things, by the way. But woe unto them that are with child, you get suck in those days, but there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon his, upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's where you've got Paul later on saying that blindness in parts happen to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in dealing with their present tense of being, I don't know what's going on with this thing. Um, 
It doesn't say the Romans sacking them. It's just all of this stuff here that's going on where he says Jerusalem being passed about with armies and know the desolation thereof is nigh and everything. This is found in the in the prophets and the the details of um <clears throat> of where the enemies come and God delivers them, not by the might of Israel or their military or anything. He's going to rain down fire and brimstone and earthquakes and all kinds of things that never happened in 70 AD and destroy their enemies and gather his elect together back in the land going into the kingdom. The reason why he says those that are in Judea which the parallel in Matthew 24 is talking about the abomination of desolation. He says, when you see that flee to the mountains of Judea is now going to come after and try to destroy the Israelites. And, and when you read in the prophets, it details that, that God has a place in the wilderness in those mountains of Judea where he's going to protect them for 42 months and keep them safe and provide all their needs for them and everything, which will be a bulk of the ones that will endure to the end and not take the mark and be part of that group that Paul says in all Israel. Will be saved. Um, okay. So when Jerusalem was surrounded by Roman armies in Luke 21, that was not the say thing. Roman armies. It says armies. It says armies. All right. Jerusalem yeah. compassed about by armies. And he says, when you see it, know that the desolation thereof is nigh. All right. It doesn't say the Roman armies. It says the armies. If you, get in, if you go to places like Ezekiel 38, where Ezekiel is prophesying in regards to those nations that are going to come against Israel in those in those last days. Um, Rome's not mentioned in there. You're, you're dealing with the, the the battle of you've got the small circle close by to Israel at that time in Ezekiel 38, and then after the thousand years is where Ezekiel 37 is talking about with the Gog and Magog, Magog War. Yeah, Ezekiel 37 and 38 in the last days. Yeah. Right. Um, totally different but, countries. Okay, so all right, so Luke twenty-one. Okay, let let me ask you this, Wade. Revelation chapter nine, when it talks about locusts coming out of the bottomless pit, what do you think this is? Do you think this exactly is literal? What it, says it is. Huh? I think exactly what it says it is. Okay, all right, because you know that in the Old Testament, Nebuchadnezzar's army was mentioned as locusts coming out of a pit. So the Roman armies as locusts coming out of a pit would make more sense, especially with the alignment of Old Testament imagery. That had that that had the 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 tail of scorpions that, that could sting like a serpent and cause them to be wanting to die for a period of five months and not be able to die. Yes. They they actually had a weapon called the scorpion. It was called the scorpion. You can look this up. And for five months, from May to September, for 150 days, they surrounded the walls of Jerusalem and beat the walls in. For 150 days, locusts, just like Nebuchadnezzar's army, with a weapon called the scorpion. Good night, Mom. Love you. Oh, man. No, that's... And the reason... One of the reasons why we know that he's talking literal there is as part of the gospel of the kingdom, those that believe that gospel and are baptized and everything, it says that these signs will follow those that believe. They'll be able to raise the dead and speak in tongues and pick up serpents and be able to drink any deadly thing. The, there's a purpose for that, under the gospel of the kingdom, the serpent thing is to protect them from in the going into those last days, to protect them from the, the the locusts that'll sting like serpents, and the wormwood is gonna poison the water 
for those that drink it, and they're being protected for it. They're not. There's not just two happenstance things that Jesus threw in there and just said, you know, so West Virginia could have a United States in 2023 or whatever. Those are specific signs that are going to follow those that believe the gospel of the kingdom and are baptized. I mean, all of that stuff like is, is specific and, you know, scripture, the plain reading of scripture is where we're to start. What are the words of it? Unless something is clearly to be taken allegorically or metaphorically, then we take the literal rendering of it, even with passages like the thousand years, which he says it six times for a reason. But the if you read scripture from that perspective and take things literally and let the church be church and and the body of Christ be the body of Christ, let Israel be Israel, read things from the plain reading of scripture, then you're going to come to the conclusion of a, you know, pre-trib, pre-millennial position eschatologically. And, you know, it, it's, and I heard you mention origin, I think, I think it was you uh, earlier and stuff that it's, it's thanks to guys like origin that, it, that I know, I'm sure you know, this introduced allegorical interpretation. And then the, you know, Augustine comes along, writes City of God and coming out of Gnosticism, nonetheless, from Manachian Gnosticism, and starts spiritualizing things that ushered in the whole preterist movement of all millennialism and then later added post millennialism. But it was all primarily the mother church in Rome in response to, you know, which they got everything wrong anyway, but in response to not wanting to be you know, mystery Babylon and Pope, the false prophet, and one of the things that were being, you know, speculated on. Already happened. And that's what launched the whole preterist movement. Um, well, it was, it, it was actually Oregon. He wrote about 6,000 different pages of books. He was more along the lines of your thinking, but after when he became an old man, after he did a lot of research, he came to the idea of preterism. He has a book called Contracelsus where he talks about it. So a lot of people. It, but I'm saying it, it it went full scale, popularized after City of God. But that's why I said Origen is the father of allegorical interpretation. He's mm -hmm. the guy that came along and said, you know what? I just don't think I need to take this Bible literally. Let's just spiritualize everything to make it. Once you start spiritualizing scripture, you can make it say anything that you want it to say. If you take a hundred people to one passage and let them all spiritualize the passage, you have the potential of a hundred different interpretations of it. Okay. Well, here's here's the thing though, Wade. In Revelation, it it literally says it says this. All right. Out of the four hundred out of the four hundred four verses, there's a there, there's a um uh, a historian, his name's G.K. Beale. I don't know if you're familiar with him. But out of the 404 verses of Revelation, 278 of them are allusions back to Old Testament imagery and Old Testament talk. And a lot of the metaphorical and po poetic language that happened with the destruction of Israel under the hands of Babylon, of the Assyrian captivity, different places, is a lot of the language that is being used in Revelation. So where <laughs> so when it comes to stuff like like um a third of the world and a fourth of the world being destroyed and all these things that happened in 70 AD. Or yeah, is that absolutely. also just metaphorical language that Well, it's it's the word Gaia. It's the word Gaia in in, in Greek and it's the word inhabited land. It's the inhabited land. It's talking about Israel. It's talking about their land. The, it's not what it the, says. the great tribulation was for them. It I was know that they're the focus of it, but it also says of the earth. Yes, yes, and that word earth is Gaia. It's the word Gaia. It's talking about the inhabited land. Not only that, 
What, what does it mean when Jesus says that the blood shed from Abel to Zechariah is on you guys? In Matthew 23, he says the blood shed from Abel to Zechariah is going to be upon you guys. That was, that was the consistent message. That's why, um, uh, you know, Jesus told the, the Pharisees and everything. Like I said, in Matthew 23, 13, he told them, you know, that you're not only preventing yourselves from going into the kingdom, but you're preventing everybody else. You slayed the the prophets and, and he condemns that it was your fathers that killed all the prophets and invited sepulchers and, and Jesus ripped them up and down. And then, and then even after that, um, Peter goes in and basically says the same thing in, in, in um, I think it's in Acts 3, where he says, he tells, essentially, when he's, when he's in the temple, in Acts 3, he says, um, It's not an X three. Uh, what, Peter, what 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 is it you're looking for? It's Peter says, um, which of your fathers? Oh, X two. Uh, it's it's X two. Which, which of your fathers would have uh, seen the prophets or something? Is it on the day of Pentecost? Where, where, where they were torn in their heart? Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken him by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. Is that what you're talking about? Acts 2, 23, 24. Um, no, that's, that's regarding... Christ. Um, does anybody else know what I'm talking about? Where Peter says something like, which of, oh wait, I, X7. It was and, uh, Stephen. Stephen, said it. Stephen that said it. You stiff necked and circ uncircumcised of heart and ear. Yeah, verse 51. Verse 51. You do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now have been now the betrayers and murdered, who received the law by the disposition of Asia who kept. This this was the indictment coming in from Stephen as well filled with the Holy Ghost, and he ticked off Israel, and with Saul looking over, they stoned Holy Ghost-filled Stephen that caused Jesus to stand up. Because if you understand the Old Testament, that when the Lord stands up, it represents judgment, and he stood up and was prepared to bring judgment, and then Aunt Stephen said, don't lay it to their charge, and, and all of that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, that was, that was consistent going all the way through Israel's history. It was, it was Israel that was killed, that killed every single one of the prophets. And that, that goes through their whole history of the whole, that everybody knows about and the cycles of judgment and everything. Um, you know, but that's. That, that goes into the, that's why at Pentecost, when people think the church started at Pentecost, they get it wrong for a number of reasons or whatever. But for one, Peter was not preaching the, 
the, the gospel of our salvation today, the gospel of Christ, believing, glorying in the cross like Paul and, and believing how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day and, and all that. He came in there and said, ye men of Israel, you crucified the Messiah. He came and you crucified him. And then it says they were pricked in heart, pricked at their heart and said, well, what do we need to do? And he said, repent, meaning believe that Jesus is the Christ of the Son of God and be baptized, water baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, not the blotting out, because Peter says in the next chapter at the temple, the blotting out doesn't happen until the um, until the second coming of Christ. And that was not our gospel, and that was Jesus baptizing them with the Holy Ghost, like he, John the Baptist said in Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize with water, but there's coming one after me who baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire, and you do not want the baptism of fire. Read the next verse, it's judgment. And so that's Jesus baptizing them with the Holy Ghost, which is different than us being baptized by one spirit into one body, being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. So you got to, you know, this, this, it's a continuation of the gospel of kingdom and they are, he's preaching, trying to get Israel to repent and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, so that their kingdom can come in. And they, they didn't do it. They not only rejected Christ, which Jesus said, me and the father are one and reject me, rejecting the father. I, I believe that. I do believe they would have received a physical kingdom if they would have accepted Christ. But that kingdom was torn out of their hands, but it was that was ultimately a part of prophecy as it was, so it would be given to the Gentiles. No, they fell after the stoning of Stephen, not 70 A.D., well, well, it says in Matthew twenty one forty three that the kingdom of God will be taken out of your hands and given to a people that will uh, meet the fruits thereof. To, to a nation. To uh, to an okay to a nation. What 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 would be that nation? The holy nation, the chosen generation, New Testament, New Covenant Israel. It comes into fruition at the second coming of Christ. Okay, so back to this. What do you think about when Jesus said the bloodshed from Abel to Zechariah being on that generation? Do you believe it's that generation or something 2,000 years out in the future? That's, what I, that's why I was just going through talking about Israel's history that Jesus and Stephen threw right in the face of especially the religious leaders about you've killed every single prophet. Your fathers are guilty of killing every prophet. Now you've killed the Messiah. Yes. And there was 4,000 years of bloodshed that was placed on that one generation. That was their great tribulation. 4,000 years of bloodshed. 4,000 years of bloodshed on one generation. He's and not, when the, no, you don't. And it, huh? That was a judicial. That was judicial on Israel. Like I said, after the stoning of Stephen, they fell and began their diminishing. And now they're blind in part until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So, so that's Israel. That's all. how all of Israel be, will be saved. Isaiah 27 says, Leviathan will be destroyed at the destruction of the altar of the chalk stones. And that happened with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Because that's when the desolation thereof was nigh, according to Luke chapter 21, when the Romans or the army surrounded Jerusalem. And the fullness of the kingdom we can have now, because we are the new Jerusalem. And we have the new heaven and new earth, where there dwells in righteousness, but sin will still exist. And death will still exist as well, as according to Isaiah 65, 20. So, it, Prophecy is clear. That when the when the nations come against Jerusalem in those last days, that God is going to go before them and destroy their enemies. He's going to rain down fire and brimstone and earthquakes to swallow them up. I mean, it goes into detail. That never happened to the Romans. 
Yes, it did. There, there's a lot of historical records you're unaware of then. Because Tacitus, Suetonius, Lucius, Cassius, Dio, and Jus Josephus all talk about this stuff. It all talks about it. it. So, so which is it then? Did Jerusalem win or did the Romans win? Well, well, Jerusalem is the heavenly Jerusalem. It's talking about the heavenly Jerusalem. You, you know, Galatians chapter 4 talks about Mount Hagar or Mount Sinai, where Hagar is. And then you have Mount Zion, where the heavenly Jerusalem lies. The heavenly Jerusalem was even talked to, to the Galatians. If you look, it's talking about the new covenant. It's talking about the Jerusalem because it's a people that are circumcised in heart. It's not talking, of, it, it, you have the old covenant, which was coming nigh unto passing, which was destroyed, not at the cross, but at the destruction of the temple. But when the temple was destroyed, the new heavens and the new earth came because it was all a covenantal system, but there's still physical death. There's still sin, according to Isaiah 65, verse 20. And, but what we can have now is, is through the body of Christ, if we learn how to love and we learn how to uh, treat each other with respect, stop calling each other heretics and all this stuff going on, we can get away from the deception of the mass media and what they have placed on us, and we can come into fulfillment of the kingdom because we are the body of Christ here on earth. The Great Tribulation occurred in 70 A.D., with the bloodshed of Abel to Zechariah on that one generation, Jesus even said to the women that were following him while he was going to the cross, women, weep not for me, but for yourselves and your children. For there's coming days where they are going to cry for the mountains to fall on them. Talking about his own generation. Weep for yourselves and your children. That is Revelation chapter 6. That is the sixth seal that was outpoured. And that is talking about the nation of Israel and their judgment. So when was all Israel saved? All Israel was saved at the destruction of the temple. Isaiah 27 tells you that. What? <laughs> go, go, go to Isaiah chapter 27 verse 9 to 12 and read it alongside Romans 11 verse 25 to 27. No, I told you if, you, if you're going to tie in Isaiah... 27 with a destruction of a temple there's going to be another temple here's the thing if you understand right division and that you can't overlap mystery and prophecy like like my dad put up there 70 AD was was something was an event that happened during the time of the mystery so there, that could have no more been prophesied than 1948 today. We're still that in mystery. That wasn't the 70th week. You're telling me the Great Tribulation, bloodshed from Abel to Zechariah on one generation after everything was fulfilled, that wasn't the Great Tribulation that was poured out on Jerusalem for those people. Three and a half years of bloodshed in that city Women actually being pregnant, starving to death, having to cut their own stomachs open so they could eat the child just so they could survive. Eating shoe leather off of the bottom of a sole just okay. so. Yeah, so like, like my dad was saying, go over to Israel and see how many believe. Um, because if all Israel was saved, then why are they currently rejecting the Messiah to this day? Because it was about the first century Israel. They missed their day of their visitation. They missed the day that Christ came, their Lord and Savior. We are when living. When did they? When yeah. did Israel repent and turn to Christ as a nation and become the born again nation prophesied in Isaiah 66? When did that happen? They, they, they did it on the day of Pentecost. All the nations mm -hmm. were there. Yes, absolutely. All the nations were there on the day of Pentecost, and they said, you even said it yourself. There the were only 3,000 people that believed. You, you, you even said it yourself. No, there, there were millions of people that were in that city at that point in time. And if you go to Acts chapter 2, it says that all of them were there at the day of Pentecost. It tells you only 3,000 people got saved at Pentecost. But it tells you all of them were there. That's what I'm saying. And I don't I, care how many were there. Scripture says 3,000 were added. 
And then only, and then if it, the, in the temple with Peter and John going in in Acts 3 and 4, another 5,000. So you think that was all Israel being saved is 8,000 people? All of Israel, according to Romans chapter 11, like I said, comes from Isaiah 27, verse 9 to 12, when the altar of the chalk stones are thrown over. It tells you, you got to take scripture and line it up with scripture. It well, tells like said, you that. You know, I went down this road with you and stuff, but man, the bottom line is, is, is all of this that we've talked about from preterism to biblical, understanding of theology for you personally doesn't mean squat and won't matter to you if you have the wrong god and to think that the god of the old testament was satan i mean well you've man, got bigger fish to fry I, I i don't want to go down this road with you right now all right yeah i mean it's I almost either. four huh? yeah, i don't either i don't either and that's why I just was back and forth on whether I want to have a discussion because like I, I don't I don't my general rule of thumb is if somebody's going to come on as a guest, they can disagree with me about anything at all. But you have to believe Jesus is God. and The Bible is the word of God. And with your aberrant position, it would fall into the category of we have a different God. You know, that's that's well, I, believe point. Jesus like, I don't have those discussions with people. There are other people like Bible guy spends hours a day debating atheists and Muslims over deity of Christ. Not look, you know, if if you don't believe Jesus is God, or if you believe that the God of the Old Testament Satan or whatever, we have a we have another God. We we are worshiping two entirely different gods. Oh, okay, all right. Well, I'm not I'm not going to get into all that with you, but basically. You have 2 million deaths attributed to Yahweh in the Old Testament, 10 deaths attributed to Satan. I wonder what's going on here. That's all I can say. All right. And it literally says that Jesus took the keys of death away from Satan. So. You don't understand why God wiped out people then, if that's the case. All right. Well, anyways, man, I there, there's nothing more I could say just... When you read Paul's letters, understand that he's getting a lot of this from Isaiah. Isaiah 25, 26, 27. 1 Corinthians 15 is from Isaiah 25. That 25 is from Isaiah 26. And Romans yeah, 11 is from Isaiah 27. Old, he, he does quote a lot of Old Testament. But when he's quoting Old Testament, he, it's dealing with Israel. It's not dealing with the body of Christ that was a mystery. So, you know, it was all unsearchable in the old testament mysteries were were was wisdom hid in god until a specific time and then revealed to the apostle paul if you read first corinthians 2 6 through 8 essentially defines what what paul means by mystery they're no longer mysteries because now they're revealed in scripture but anything that's a mystery is unsearchable in old testament scripture anywhere they were hid in god and, and revealed to paul Okay, so 1 Corinthians 15, who was that written to? Man, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of... It's, it's my last question, then I'm done. 1 Corinthians 15, who was it written to? To the Corinthians. Okay, the church, right? There, now, the Corinthian church yes he was writing to body of christ church that most of them were uh, if you more than any of the other churches that he established were former jews that are now part of the body of christ and no longer jew or gentile in the body of christ but in first corinthians 15 he's talking about the theme of resurrection and before he even gets to the mystery of the rapture, he details the first resurrection about Christ as the first fruits, and then those after and everything. Which first resurrection began with Christ, and then at his second coming, the Old Testament saints will be 
resurrected to go into the kingdom along with the, the martyrs during Daniel's seventh week will also be resurrected. And that is the completion of the first resurrection. The second resurrection of the unjust happens after the millennial kingdom thousand years to be resurrected and stand before judgment of the great white throne. The, the rapture is none of, it's not part of the first resurrection or the second resurrection. Those were prophesied, but the body, the body of Christ being caught up out of here was a mystery revealed to Paul. So. Okay. All right. So first Corinthians 15 is mainly a Jewish. Uh... No, I'm just saying that he's, that he's, he's right. He's, I mean, it starts off with our gospel being summarized in the first four verses. That's, that is the summary of the gospel, the grace of God, the gospel of Christ revealed to Paul of how we're saved. And then he starts going through and then the theme of the whole rest of the chapter is, is primarily around resurrection. As a topic, the whole idea of resurrection, he starts talking about the different aspects of it and the different phases of resurrection. Okay. I gotcha. All right. Well, that verse where he says, O sin, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Um, that's coming from Isaiah 25. And that's talking about the uh, the veil that was going to be ripped off of the people when, um, when uh, Mount Sinai was thrown over. And, uh, Can you even send you a nine volt battery, by the way? Huh? Do you need me to get like a nine volt battery? Why you say that? Because your smoke detector is beeping. Yeah, uh, it's it's all right. It's it's all good, man. I think that was once. I th I think I think it's like I, I need to get ready for bed. Honestly, it's like four a.m. over here. That's uh, same here. I'm Eastern. Oh, yep, same here. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Interesting conversation. Um, yeah, absolutely. I pray you. Uh, I pray you depart from your Gnosticism and and uh, believe the God of Scripture. Well, I could I could say that. <laughs> see vice versa, Wade. Honestly, I've I've studied a lot, man. I I. Let's put it this way, man. And I've had a lot of tribulation in my life. So, and God said, uh, you're going to have a lot of tribulation in order to seek the kingdom. So, love you, Dad. But, anyways, man, um, yeah, I mean, there's, well, the thing is, I mean, what, let, let me ask. Hey, here, here would be my suggestion to you. Because I don't know how long you've been. I don't think you, I don't think you were fully into Gnosticism a couple years ago when I used to actually watch videos and stuff. Or were you? Uh, it's it's been about it's been about a year and a half, two years. Well, my suggestion to you is, I'd be very careful using using your platform to. It's one thing to teach preterism. It's another thing to get on here and teach your Gnostic views that the God of the Old Testament is Satan. You're going to storm one day, and it's one thing for you to believe it, but to actually get on social media and, I'm sorry, but to deceive people that are listening and thinking, you know, oh, he seems like he knows a lot of verses or this, that, and the other. And like today you were getting into believing in reincarnation and the third eye and the penal. I mean, dude, like, well, it's all biblical. It's all in the Bible. I can show you where it's in the Bible, but I mean, it, it is what it is. Honestly, you would have, you would have gotten along really well with Augustine. I can tell you that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think so because I used to be more literal. In my views, when I first started out for the first three to four years, I was more literal. I've gotten more metaphorical, more allegorical. And uh, uh, that that combined with the fact that that he came out of Manichaean Gnosticism. And that's where he dragged all this idea of 
the Calvinist version of predestination and total depravity and election and all that. That's straight out of Manichaean Gnosticism. That's what they called themselves, the elect, and that they were predestined and fatalist and all this stuff. But you yeah. guys could have had a long, long weekend sitting around, go through a few pots of coffee, getting along with all that. <laughs> I'm sure we could have, man. But it's... It's it's been a respectful talk as it is, man. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, what 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 do you expect for the next couple? Of, you believe the rapture is going to take place here pretty soon? Do you believe Jesus is going to return by twenty twenty eight, or the tribulation is going to start this year, or what? I I before you got on tonight, um, it pointed out that that. I'll be shocked if we're here in two years and it has nothing to do with signs and the jab and none of the, you know, not even like the news and the media and stuff as much as I just believe that in the principle of God took six days to create this, this world and um, he rested on the seventh and we've got 6,000 years of human history and I believe that seventh one thousand, you know, days is a year, is a year is a thousand, or a thousand years is a day, days is a thousand years, like with God. I believe that that seventh day is the seventh millennium that is when Israel, as Hebrews talks about and the prophets talk about, will enter into their rest. And I think that that's, that seven thousand, that seventh one thousand year period that Revelation 21, or Revelation 20, verse seven. Yeah, it says six times a thousand years that 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 thousand years <clears throat> will begin two thousand years probably to the nanosecond from the ascension of Christ where he will come in like manner as he left and I think that if he ascended in say 32 AD that in 2032 he's coming back which you take seven years off of that I just I and if it was 31 AD so I just conservatively, I'll be shocked if we're here beyond two years from now. Okay. Well, I mean, the thing is, whatever, whatever the case may be, you said something really interesting, though. Yeah, I, I can't remember. I'm, I'm too tired. But, anyways, man, I, 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 re I, I respect you for for having me coming on, and uh, it being a respectful talk, as it is. Um, yeah. I mean, that's as long as there's a respectful conversation like this, I, I have no problem having people come on and have these discussions and disagree and stuff. It's just there aren't very many, there aren't a lot, especially this far of a gap between your position and your understanding of God and eschatology and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a very, respectful conversation I appreciate that and hopefully it gave gave you some things to think about and that it was edifying to the listeners so. yeah absolutely absolutely all right man bless you you have yourself a good night all right get some good rest